much, Mark. So let me first say for those who are new here that our library always gets better by the suggestions of the members. So if you see a book is missing and so on, so please remind our librarian. Okay, so symplectic dynamics. So a field you presumably haven't heard too much about because that's a name we just thought might be appropriate for something which seems to be starting. So historically, um, if you look where you find sort of the roots of uh, the modern theory of dynamical systems as well as symplectic geometry, I think you can make a point that it started with Poincaré, who had actually quite, he, he had sort of integrated ideas about this. So like differential forms come up uh, when you study symplectic maps. So there's a lot of mathematics which was created around actually Poincaré's interest in celestial mechanics. And it, it led to an enormous amount of ideas in pure mathematics. So now, then later on, these fields uh, developed quite independently. And you presumably can also say that uh, symplectic, uh, that uh, dynamical systems actually developed maybe more rapidly than symplectic geometry. And uh, now with KM theory, I would consider this as part of, of uh, dynamical systems. If you look at symplectic geometry, uh, around the 60s, uh, 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 the language of symplectic geometry was developed, but and it, it, there was a body of idea of, of, of open problems, which m many of them are called Arnold conjectures, but nobody in the field actually had any idea how to solve them. So, so actually, I made a joke at that point uh, characterizing this field, which I, I, I actually regret now. Is, uh, <laughs> I said, well, symplectic geometry is, is, is a language where you can take any problem you want, you reformulate as another problem, you would even recognize the same and you still can't solve it. <laughs> However, now, then of course at some point, that actually became an asset when the right methods were found. So now, the rationale uh, behind this current program is in fact to um, bring uh, these two directions uh, together around a common core, so basically continue how uh, Poincaré started, but now symplectic geometry, which has grown dramatically since the beginning of the 80s, has a lot of machinery to offer, but the idea of the program is definitely not to just take some ideas from symplectic geometry, apply them to dynamical systems, it's just rather develop these ideas further by asking a different set of questions, for example. So now, how did symplectic geometry start? It actually started a long, long time ago, but it took also because it's not such an, <coughs> such an easy notion a long time to uh, develop. So Euler, he was, like all these guys, interested in celestial mechanics, and Euler knew, or I think he, might, he even invented the restricted three-body problem when you want to describe two masses and the third one which is so small that you can disregard it. So now you know the two body problem is integral. You can write down the solutions and then you want to describe the smaller body uh, with respect to the system. So he knew, for example, the Lagrange points. He was the first to find the Lagrange points. So then <laughs> so <laughs> Lagrange was the first to found Hamiltonian systems. <laughs> Actually, uh, um, Alan Weinstein looked into this, he found that he was the first who wrote uh, the motion of the planets in what we would call today Hamiltonian form. So now, I, I, I'm, so if somebody knows what Hamilton invention was named after Poincaré, I would be thankful, unfortunately, I didn't find anything, <laughs> anything here. So how did modern global symplectic geometry start? It actually also has an interesting starting point. It starts actually with a proof that it doesn't exist. So I, let me give you this <laughs> sort of proof. So the proof is actually a quotation from a paper of, uh, of Moser. So Moser um, was interested in some results which were proved by Alan Weinstein and, and uh, generalized them. And then he writes in this paper the following. This uh, action principle, which you find critical points for this, today produces what is called um, rabinowitz fleur theory. All these cousins produce the rest of symplectic geometry. And there are other problems in young meals, uh, so Seiberg Witten Fleur theory and so on. They all have characteristic features. So, however, this variational principle is very degenerate 
For example, even the Legendre condition is violated and is certainly not suitable for an existence proof. Now today, one uses this precisely for this. So what went wrong there? Well, what went wrong there is that Moser knew very well all the literature about Morse theory. Also, infinite dimensional Morse theory at that point existed to some extent was Pali and Smale, the generalizations. However, there it was always important that the critical points had a finite index or finite co-index, and this was a variational problem where you have an infinite index in both directions. So now if you know Morse theory, if you pass a critical point, you attach a handle of a particular dimension given by the Morse index, and if you attach an infinite dimensional handle, you change uh, the type by, a, by the homotopy type of a sphere, and that is the sphere. Uh, the problem is the sphere is contractible in infinite dimensions, and there's no change of topology. And all the existence proof based on variational principle use that you know the global topology, and you say, therefore, by Mox theory, there has to be a critical point somewhere, for example. And that precisely doesn't work because any critical point you pass, the homotopy type of the space doesn't change. That was, of course, that is if you want to, try to study general variational problems, but they might have a little bit of additional structure, and that is what wasn't known about that problem. It has a little bit additional structure. You can essentially talk about the difference of two Mox indices despite the fact they are both infinite. That is the difference to the generic general problem which doesn't work. Of course, having students which don't listen to their advisors is also good. So Rabinowitz was a st former student of Moser, and he didn't know that he couldn't do it. Uh, uh, so he actually, uh, two, uh, so this is actually a little bit later, but two months after Moser uh, wrote this paper, he proved actually that you have periodic orbits for, Hem for infinite dimension Hamiltonian systems, not finite dimension he was interested in. And then Moser said that he had made his mistake. He said, well, if you can do this, you can also prove existence in finite dimension systems. That is what happened in this paper. So that is, from my point of view, sort of the start of symplectic geometry that the action principle, which is extremely important, was becoming useful. Then uh, Conley and Sender used this and put it in a more complicated context, with, which was one of the Arnold conjectures. Where uh, so this was actually the case that a problem in symplectic geometry, where nobody in symplectic geometry had any idea, was solved by, by somebody, so by a group of people coming from outer space, sort of by completely different uh, sets of methods. Of course, Eddie, I think I can say this: you didn't even know that the Arnold conjecture existed. But for <laughs> so, the, so the good thing was that John Maser was around, who actually knew about this. And he said, you guys do all this complicated stuff. Why not proving the Arnold conjecture? And that was the result of actually meeting of uh, Conley, Sender, and Maser at the Forschungs Institute at the ETH. <coughs> so then Gromov came and he introduced pseudomorphic curves. But he's thinking, he, of course, he knew this result, but his thinking was quite different. He thought about this in, 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 in and I, will, I will actually explain a lot of the things later on. So he, he saw it in terms of uh, holomorphic curves, which one could view as sort of uh, some kind of minimal surfaces for certain metrics associated to this with some additional properties. But he didn't incorporate this variational viewpoint, which was inherent here. And then Fleur combined both. And if you learn about this field today, it looks all very natural because you, you are being explained these two things simultaneously. This was a forceps birth. So, for example, uh, Gromov did not believe that this was correct. There was actually a serious dispute for some time about that these things, which are actually quite similar from the view, fit together. So that uh, took uh, quite some time. Of course, then at some point it, it became clear. So, now what is symplectic geometry? So, symplectic geometry is where is, is a geometry where the fundamental notion is a signed area. So now, of course, we don't grow up in a world where everything around us is a signed area. So most things around us are sort of things like distance, length. So we are accustomed in the, uh, we grow up in a world where we feel comfortable with a notion like a metric, for example, or more easily comfortable, despite the fact that metrics can also be quite tricky. But here, it's a, it's a quite different uh, 
basic notion, which is a little bit hard to digest at first. So let me explain this. So now, of course, if you go to a course today, they well, it's implied in manifold, it's a manifold equipped with a, a non-degenerate two-form of uh, closed two-form. Now, what does that really mean? Yeah? Uh, what does that intrinsically mean for the geometry? Uh, but it means actually a lot, but it's not so clear what, what kind of geometric viewpoint one should take here. So let me first explain to you why area is important. And in symplectic geometry, a lot of the good stuff is not standing in front of you and say, I'm good. It's, you have to go around and you see a little thing coming out of the floor and you start digging. And usually there's a big body underneath. So one, should al one always has to be going a little bit careful around. And here, let me explain to you why area is important. So, so of course, if you start, suppose you, you, you model a physical system, the points here are the states of the system and uh, what happens after some time unit is, is described by a map. So you take a state, you feed it into this map, and you get another state. So now, then of course, from a topological point of view, if you ask the question, is there a state which is fixed under, uh, at all time, or of course, the answer is yes, that's uh, the Brauer's fixed point theorem. But now, let me, remove the, let me remove the bound, let me look what happens if I have a boundary, <coughs> if I don't have a boundary. So you see, I, c I can define a map where this is a fixed point. If I start here, I would move along the boundary if I iterate the map, and if I'm here, I move along this curve. So you see the boundary is left invariant. If you remove this, you have a map on the disk which doesn't have a fixed point. However, a miracle happens here. This is uh, also due to um, this is also due to Brauer. Is if you have say a continuous T, which uh, is a, a, a homeomorphism on the open disk, which preserves area, then there has to be a fixed point. So that phenomenon which we just saw, where I remove the boundary, does not occur. And this uh, follows from uh, one can give several proofs for it. So one, uh, Brauer's proof is like this. He proved if you have a home, an orientation preserving homeomorphism of the plane and there is no fixed point, then it's actually conjugated to a translation. Now, if it's conjugated to a translation, you find an open set, non-empty, which under iteration produces disjoint images, but it would have positive measure, so the disk would have infinite measure. So that situation is impossible. It must have a fixed point. So now, of course, you can ask, how do I generalize this? If you hear area, you just say volume in higher dimensions, but volume doesn't produce this kind of phenomenon. It's something else. So the right generalization is this. So first of all, you meditate for a while about area and orientation preserving. Then you can do, of course, the following. If you have a simple loop and go counterclockwise, you associate to this loop the area surrounded positively. Clockwise, the area associated negatively. If you go several times <coughs> around the loop, you multiply by the multiplicity. And now if you take an arbitrary loop, you can actually partition it in certain cases, uh, in, in certain pieces of this kind. So uh, you have to do it for piecewise smooth loops. And you associate to a loop just the sum of the signed areas with multiplicity. And that is being preserved as well. So now what can you do then in higher dimensions? Well, draw a loop projected of, view the higher dimension space as a copy of planes and project it down and associate to this, let me call it still the area, to these loops and take the sum. It's a signed area, it can be positive or negative. And this associates to every loop in this, this trivial space, a product of, of planes, two planes, an area. Then of course the transformation of interest are maps and maps map loops to loops. And it's symplectic, you could say if a loop goes to a loop with the same area. That's symplectic geometry. So now you can contrast you when you study Euclidean or metric geometry, then you talk about you associate to two states a distance and you're interested in transformation, say iso isometries which preserve the distance. Here you associate to a loop of states and variant and, to, uh, and the, the transformations of interest are those which, is, which preserve this invariant associated to a loop. As you see, successfully I have avoided the use of differential forms. However, if you analyze this notion, it's a good idea to invent differential forms after this here. In particular, when you invent differential forms here, you will see that deformations of maps come from Hamiltonian systems. That if you describe spaces like this and you look for things which preserve this, that there has to be an energy in the background, the Hamiltonian. 
Of course, in physics, it went the other way. They had energy, and then they found that this structure is, is there. So, of course, then you can go and take this brainy space, and you ask, can you put a structure on there? You, so you don't, don't want to collide with topology here. You, you, you want to associate two small, tiny loops. You want to associate an invariant. And if you can do that in some consistent way, that's the symplectic space. And if you try to uh, come up with other descriptions, well, you would say a smooth manifold with uh, closed two form of uh, uh, non-degenerate closed two form. Okay, so this is symplectic geometry, and, and of people study, of course, which spaces allow such a structure and so on. Okay, so that's sort of the symplectic background. So now let's become a little bit more serious here. So. So what we, what we associate to a loop is, a sign, is an area, and we're talking about a signed area, and the, the infinitesimal version would be the following. You have two vectors, and two vectors, you have a parallelogram, and associate to this an area. So that would be, of course, if you define a bilinear, non-degenerate bilinear map. So now, so, so this is a si signed infinitesimal area. So if you have a signed infinitesimal area, you could think, is it possible to talk um, uh, some kind of a metric area which is sort of in the best possible situation attained? And the answer is yes. In for all metrics obtained in the following way, you take on this space, so we're in R to N, a complex multiplication so that this here defines an inner product, a positive definite inner product. In this case, the metric area would be given by this formula Hmm? J is a complex mu multiplication. It's J, the matrix J square e equals minus the identity. So it would turn R to N in the complex vector space. And then we can define associated to this metric an area. And the relationship between is always this, with equality precisely if this vector here is J of E. So this two span a complex line. Now, if you know this, then you, and that was Gromov's reasoning, then, surf, then after choosing this auxiliary data, J. Now, of course, in, in, in the general case, we would now have a symplectic, we have this manifold, we have omega, this uh, two form, and we choose an almost complex structure. So this would be sort of the situation at each point. And then, what, what, is, what kind of natural object you could look at? Well, I could look at surfaces, which have the property that at each point, the, the signed area I can associate to them is precisely the metric area. And the wonderful thing is, this is an elliptic partial differential equation, yeah? namely a nonlinear Cauchy Riemann equation. So now, if at this point, this is 1985, around or 84, now we knew already at this point, through work by Donaldson, that you can use elliptic PDEs to produce geometric invariants. You fix some auxiliary, he did it for young meals, you fix auxiliary data, you construct a solution space and count solutions, and then you show it doesn't depend on the auxiliary data you do. Well, here we have an elliptic PDE. I mean, there might be a lot of difficulties coming with this because they are usually not really compact and so on. But you could try the same scheme, and that is, for example, gromov witten invariants. So that's Gromov's reasoning. You look for, for maps defined on a Riemann surface, so the tangent map is complex linear. So you're looking for the images of Riemann surface, or alternatively, say, for, for if there would be embedded really to look at for submanifolds, which where the tangency at a point is a complex line, with respect to the auxiliary structure. Okay, so now, how far did this develop? This, you don't, so I'm not going to explain you. Siri, one could talk for hours about this. So there are, presumably you heard all the words. I mean, it's difficult to avoid them. But what they all are, they are all bookkeeping devices for counting this holomorphic curves in one way or the other, like gromov witten theory. Fleur theory counts um, fixed points of symplectic maps, symplectic transformations, and divides out by relations coming from precisely this kind of things, this curve which I just showed you. Then there are other theories based on this, but which have some additional features, namely, I will explain that a little bit more. You could imagine that if you study symplectic geometry and forget about the symplectic structure, then that there is a theory which would produce, say, homology, singular homology. But 
there's something more interesting living above if we just study symplectic spaces. And in symplectic spaces, of course, we have more structure. We can talk about the area associated to a loop. So, so then you would say, well, maybe the tiny loops, the constant loops, see the, see the topological space, and the big loops see something else. And that's, in fact, true. So then in dimensions three and four, of course, Dimensions three and four is, of course, related by three plus one equals four, and four is equals two plus two. And, and, uh, and holomorphic curves are two-dimensional real objects, and you have an intersection theory for two two-dimensional objects. So you would think there should be a little bit more rigidity coming just from this fact. In particular, if you know, or already can guess that there is a positivity associated with holomorphic curves, the intersection number of holomorphic curves is always positive. That gives enormous amount of rigidity in the subject. Okay, so after now, we all know <laughs> what symplectic <laughs> geometry is about. Let's, so uh, let's talk about what we are going to do with this. Okay, so now a basic fact in symplectic uh, geometry is that embedding obstructions are actually related to the dynamics on the boundary. So that actually was found uh, in the woods here at the Institute, this statement. They are somewhere. Uh, in, in 19, I can actually point it out. I think it's a good place. 19, in, uh, in 1988, uh, I was here for a semester, and I had a visit. I was at Watkins at this point, uh, and they, uh, they allowed me to, to go here. And um, I had a visitor, Eva Eckland, and we uh, started this, what's called today, symplectic capacities. And it was motivated by Gromov's non squeezing result to understand this. And this result was based on um, the isoparametric inequality using his holomorphic curves. And we actually found that it was related to dynamics as well. And in fact, the dynamics produced infinitely many independent, of, independent invariants of the same kind, which came out uh, uh, rather than, than the one which came out of his theory. Of course, then one could look, one could also get more out of the holomorphic curve theory. So let me explain to you at this point why actually uh, the embedding obstructions have something to do with the dynamics. So the, so the gram of non-squeezing results says the following. You take the Euclidean ball in R2n, say of the radius small r, and you take the two disk of radius cap r cross r2n minus 2, and uh, the splitting is like the r2 cross r2 cross r2 in the way how I project these curves. Yeah, so it would be, in the first copy of uh, the R2 would be a small disk of radius, and then I would multiply it by R2 cross R2, and, and so on, and this would be called the symplectic cylinder. For physicists, the R2, the first copy of the disk would be the Q1P1 space, and, there would, be, and would be constrained to be the Euclidean ball of radius R, and there's no constraint on the higher coordinates. So now Gromov proved if you can symplectically embed this into the cylinder, the radius of that disk here has to be greater or equal to the radius of the ball, which says that you might waste a fantastic amount of volume. So, so you could might have thought that, well, maybe I can fold it in and can make the cylinder arbitrarily thin. If, if, on, the C if on the C0 level, you wouldn't really see uh, the symplectic structure. But you can't, so this actually, tells you also that the symplectic structure already lives on a, on, on a lower level than just C1, which you need to define it, say, at least in the naive way. So then, so let's assume now there is an optimal way to squeeze it. So take the infimum of all cylinders where that thing fits in, and let's assume it actually fits in. Now, so we start with some domain. There's a small, we know there's an infimum of all radius that I can embed it. Let's assume you can embed this into the smallest one. So what do you see? Well, so here we have this thing embedded. So we take a cross section here. This would be R to n minus 2. We see this picture. Here's another cross section. We see this. But what I claim is we have to see this. There's a cross section where we have to see this picture, which would mean in this cross section it would be completely filled green for at least one of the sections because I optimally squeezed it. And I'll give you the proof of this. The reason is the following. So how, so, I, I, so how do you create Hamiltonian, uh, so how, how do you create maps which preserve this additional structure which we have? 
So, so you create it by taking Hamiltonian vector fields or time-dependent families of Hamiltonian vector fields. And how do you construct them in R2? In R2, you take a map. So you have V on Q1, P1 space. Think of the R2 also with your Euclidean structure. The symplectic form is dx, dy. Then you take the gradient of that map and you rotate by 90 degrees counterclockwise. That's the vector field. So for example, if the Hamiltonian, this function, the energy is increasing this direction, then the gradient would be sort of tangent. And rotated by 90 degrees, it puts inside. And if I then let this thing evolve by this, it would move inside. Obviously, I cannot increase all the time on a circle. So let's assume such picture would not arise, and there would be some area where this is away. I would increase, increase, but tiny, 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 tiny bit. And then when it's away, I go down slowly. If I let this flow, the stuff here, which wasn't completely filled, would allow it to move a little bit in that direction, and everything else would be moved in. And then you take a partition of unity with respect to the remaining Q2, P2 variables, put it together, and it, it verified fits together. And if, all this, if never any slice looks like this, you can squeeze it into a smaller cylinder. So what, do, but, okay, so Q, but what does that mean? Well, what it means is actually that the touching set between the squeezed thing and the other has common periodic orbits. This set here, where the touch has a common periodic orbit. For, so now, how, what does that mean? So as you, I think, know from a physics course, which you presume it took at some point, uh, you know that if you have an autonomous Hamiltonian system, the energy is preserved. If you have a hypersurface, say, co-orientable, nor, uh, normally orientable, you can find a Hamiltonian which has this as an energy surface. If you take two Hamiltonians having the same energy surface, then the only thing which differs is actually the time parameterization of the orbits. So you can talk about periodic orbits on an energy surface without reference to a Hamiltonian system, just to a hypersurface. And we have two hypersurfaces. One is the cylinder, the boundary of the cylinder, and the other is the squeezed thing lying uh, lying, so here is the boundary of this one has a hypersurface and the other one. And we can talk about periodic orbits on them, and they must, they must coincide. Okay, now this has been used now to develop a theory of obstructions. So suppose this greenish thing here is a set lying in the set so where this is a boundary of some reddish stuff. Now, on the boundary, we have periodic orbits. They can be viewed as energy surfaces. We have periodic orbits. And it's possible to group them. There, you, you look at them and say, well, you guys belong to that group, and you guys belong to this group. And let's assume they're all contractible. Otherwise, you have to say something more. Since they're contractible, I can assume we don't have other topological issues to deal with. You can spin in some surface. And, that would, and then you integrate the symplectic form of the surface. That's the area associated to this one. And so, so this set of periodic orbits, which you see here, has an associated signed area, and this set as well. And you are interested in surfaces precisely of the kind which I described, the surfaces whose tangency is actually complex linear. They are positive. So if you have a certain area here, then you add this, air, this surface to it, you see that this periodic orbits here have a bigger area associated to them than this one. So for example, if I can embed a certain set into another set, and I know by some higher reasons that between corresponding groups of, of uh, periodic orbits, which belongs to, to the same category, there has to be a surface, I can only embed it if the area associated to this is smaller than the area associated to this, because if I have an existence proof for such a surface, that takes a positive amount of area. So, so there is an organization of the periodic orbits by <coughs> these surfaces, and they act a little bit like minimal surfaces to define obstructions. Now, what I already mentioned before is that here is just an example how these things are being organized. So if I give you an open subset, uh, or an open, say an open subset in a symplectic manifold, 
you can look at all the loops in this manifold, and each loop has an area associated to this. Then you can say, what can I construct out, out, out of all the loops which I have, which have an area between A and B, and there's a method to construct a homology associated to this particular subset of loops, which is this, and there are some other gradings. And it's, and it's related to the usual homology by, if this is zero here and this is epsilon, which would be sort of the tiny loops, and the tiny loops are basically the constant loops, and the constant loops just see U as a topological space. And the big loops, actually start seeing stuff, they try to, to explore the whole space when they are lying flat against the boundary and parameterize the periodic orbit. That is when they start seeing something. And then for three such numbers, we have an AB, a AC, and a BC, and not surprisingly an exact sequence. So between these groups. So, so there are periodic orbits, for example, which see everything, and you can put a zero here, here zero and an infinity, these are some kind of global invariants. And there are periodic orbits who see something, but not everything. And so, there's some, so, and so therefore, we have cancellations which are described by this exact sequence. So that is the picture. And this is basically true for all the theories which we have, and I mentioned before, say, flow, this um, symplectic field theory and embedded contact homology and so on. So now, so, so in some sense, what one can make actually rigorous, it takes a, a lot of time, is one can say that the rigidity of a symplectic manifold with boundary is partially, so we don't understand to which extent, is and I will raise some questions, and it's partially encoded in the periodic, in the boundary and holomorphic curves defining relations between them. That's, that's the picture. So now, this has particularly strong con consequence in dimension three and raises questions in higher dimensions. So let me talk about the, uh, how we are going to use this in dynamics. So, so assume this here is an odd dimensional manifold. This is sort of the restriction of a symplectic form to this. So it's, it's a, a two close two form of maximal rank. And this lambda, is a one form so that, which is non-trivial on the kernel of that two form here. So we have, uh, that is a vol uh, volume form. And then, of course, this defines a vector field. It contracts omega to zero and is normalized by this. So this is uh, sort of the most general Hamiltonian energy surface you can think of. Now, the dynamics of this, in fact, can now be viewed as part of the pseudo-holomorphic geometry associated to this thing here by making a choice of a complex structure. So let me explain this. So on R cross M, we take an almost complex structure which has the following main features. It should be R invariant, and it should couple the one vector here with the vector field X, the Hamiltonian vector field on this, and it should leave the kernel of lambda invariant. Yeah, so let, let's look at the data here. Omega has a kernel which defines the then in which we pick the vector field. We normalize the vector field to be one. Yeah, lambda doesn't vanish on the kernel. Of course, then the kernel of lambda is a, is a plane field distribution, hyper plane field distribution transversal to the vector field, even dimensional. And, we, and, and if we restrict omega to the kernel of lambda, it's actually a symplectic, a symplectic vector bundle. So we can choose a complex multiplication in the kernel of lambda. And then we have two things left, which is a vector field in the R direction, and we couple this in the obvious way by mapping one to the vector field. So now we have an R in almost complex structure. And what is interesting here? Well, what is interesting are precisely the curves which I introduced before, the curves which have complex tangencies, tangent spaces. So for example, Every orbit for the flow cross R is a complex immersed or plane. plane. Yeah, just take the orbit for the flow cross R. It's holomorphic. Take a periodic orbit, a cylinder, is a holomorphic cylinder. But what is interesting is that there are a lot of other things which uh, relate different objects. 
like here, a three punctured torus, where if you go to the puncture, you approach, it, approach a cylinder of a periodic orbit here, another puncture, a cylinder of a periodic orbit here, and here you go in the negative direction and approach this. So now, in, if I project, for example, this object here into the manifold, I get something like this. I have two peri three periodic orbits and a piece of surface spanned by this. So now this gets fantastically strong in dimension three, because in dimension three, this thing, and it follows from the differential equation, tries to be transversal to the flow. That's, so it means this, the flow will try to be transversal to the surface, or the surface try to be transversal to the flow, however you want to take this. So if you can construct a lot of these surfaces, you can actually gain an insight what's, what the flow does. So now, uh, so some time ago, uh, Sotsky, Tsin, and I, we introduced this, so this is cylinders and the others, and we showed, for example, if you take a star-shaped energy surface in, R, in R4, which was actually essentially the first uh, res result by Rabinovitz was about this, that you can foliate this energy surface in the complement of a finite number of periodic orbits by surfaces of this type. So, so, so you are on a three-sphere, you have a dynamical system on the three-sphere, then uh, just first multiply it by R if, if you want, and then you're looking for R-invariant foliations. R-invariant foliations means if I apply the R action, either I get the same leaf or a different leaf, and the leaves are all uh, such curves, which I described before, and as, are asymptotic to periodic orbits. So, so here's another viewpoint, how you can see this. So if you think of R3, uh, of S3 as R3 with a point infinity, and you think of this as a copy of R2 here, and if you assume that, that, that you have some kind of a symmetry around this, at least here in that area, then these two dots are the traces of a periodic orbit. Then this line, this segment here, is a trace of a disk spent by this. And these are all disks, and this is a disk going through infinity. So, so the, the picture is, you have a periodic orbit here, and disk goes through the space infinity, and they're all transversal to the flow. Then um, this has strong consequences. For example, this is true for all energy surface bounding a convex domain. Then you have this picture here, no generosity, no assumption whatsoever. Then if you have this, it's clear, if you fix one of those guys, you, you start on this and you wait till it comes back, you get a global return map. So we have a one periodic orbit here, then we have by Brouwer another periodic orbit coming from the first fixed point. Then you take that fixed point away, then we have an annulus and we have a return map on an annulus. And John Franks showed that if it has a periodic point, it has infinitely many. So out of this, you just get on a convex energy surface, you have either precisely two periodic orbits or infinitely many, which is precisely for the standard case, for the simplest example where you can make a computation, that's an ellipsoid, where, which is the energy surface of two harmonic oscillators. Either they are in resonance, you have infinitely many, or they are not, then you have two. So it stays true under nonlinear perturbations. And it's ac actually true in most cases, even without convexity, where you have pictures like this, several periodic orbits, in the same way. And you can just like here, this is, this is the stable manifold of this hyperbolic orbit. It has an area, the area is preserved, and just by looking areas, you can say fantastic things about uh, the dynamics. So now, you think of these rotating? yeah, I think of them as rotating. So now, a tough one, the smooth area preserving disk map. So in dynamical systems, the, air, the smooth area preserving disk map has wasted many lives, maybe, or has kept many people busy. It's, it is a complicated problem. Everybody worked on this. And there's this fantastic, there's this fantastic uh, conjecture which says, if you take a smooth area preserving, the generic choice of a smooth area preserving disk map has positive measure theoretic entropy. Surprisingly, there's no single example known. There's no example known where they actually could show that that is the case. But the conjecture is generically the case. Of course, that's a really enticing conjecture. And, uh, and a lot of people worked on this. And, and uh, well, now we started also working on this. <laughs> and um, 
we think that um, we get a little, we have an additional piece of information which wasn't there before. If that's enough, is a different question, but um, it might, well, you know, if you're lucky, sometimes things work out. So. Okay, so how does it fit into this general <laughs> framework? So if you have an error preserving disk map, you just uh, can actually produce a Hamiltonian flow on a solid torus so that the return map is precisely the one you started with. Okay, so, so now this has a boundary in contrast to the examples which I had before, but that is not too serious. And now let me describe some of uh, the results of uh, Barney Bremer. I will not say too much. So he, he gave a talk here not long ago in this 15 minutes, and he will give a lecture at our conference. So let me uh, amplify here something which is different from what, what, what he was uh, talking here about. So now, so what you want to do is you want to s create foliations in this torus by, surf by projected holomorphic curves projected from R across the torus, so, uh, which gives you a singular foliation below, which either consists of nice surfaces transversal to the flow or periodic orbits. So, so, so with other words, if, if, if the disk map is generic, you would have uh, a finite number of periodic orbits in this picture, and you would have surfaces otherwise spent by these periodic orbits. But, uh, but foliating everything is a complement of this, and the flow would be transversal to these things. So now, since we have boundary, the, uh, so first of all, of course, you want to study the global dynamics. So you, you would, for example, for studying the first iterate of the disk map, you would have the torus where you identify this with this. So if you look at the second iterate, you would identify this longer torus. And you fix almost complex structure here, and you extend it periodically. Then, for example, if you construct something here, it would still give a foliation here, but it would go several times around. It would have a non-trivial degree with respect to the S1. So now, in this case, the, 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 the leaves are actually of the form either an, an infinite annulus or a positive cylinder with a boundary or a negative cylinder with a boundary. And, so, uh, he, and this refers to the R direction. That means if you go to the infinity here, in the R direction you would go to plus infinity or, do, or to minus infinity, which only says something about the orientation, how you hit the periodic orbit either in the direction of the flow or otherwise for some underlying orientation. So these are the pictures you get. So these are periodic orbits here, and the whole thing is foliated by the surfaces. And if you take a slice, it looks like this. So these are fixed points, and you observe here that you have rigid surfaces, but you have also family of surfaces which are obtained by gluing two rigid surfaces. Now all these things are transversal, and you have a boundary condition for some frame. You can say, if I go over a certain period, I go a certain number of times around. So now, you can have different boundary conditions, like, say, depending, minus 1, 1, 0. And the interesting thing is what he proves is, give me any periodic orbit and any boundary condition, and I construct a foliation having this boundary condition and that periodic orbit. So if you now think about that you start, say, with a fixed point of the time one map, then a fixed point you can view as a periodic orbit for higher periods. You can just say, I always want to see this guys and it iterates with certain foliations, with certain boundary conditions for the foliations. And these things are always transversal. Then, these things are always projections of holomorphic curves in R cross the solid torus, and they are all holomorphic for the same underlying almost complex structure. So there is an intersection theory in the background. You can talk about positive intersection theory for this. So now you can imagine how many constraints you get out of this in the study of such a flow. Then observe that I think what, what is particularly interesting is that here the rigid surfaces act like gates. So if I start here, I have, to, I have to always be transversal to the surface, but, this, but these things are very specific. There are some gates. I could say I'm interested in orbits which go in there and go through gate alpha, beta, gamma, and come out. So it's a tool to create partitions, and partitions are precisely what the uh, metric entropy or the measure theoretic entropy is about. So, so it, it introduces some interesting 
new piece which seems to have the right words in it. So now, so, so we, I cannot report anything about uh, this particular problem I started with, but I can say that um, it solves some interesting class of problems in dynamical systems, which uh, people in dynamic systems did not have any clue how to handle this. So, so first of all, it turns out that this foliation business solves, uh, so you can reprove all the classical results by one idea. So poincare Birkhoff fixed point theorem, you get out, you get the results out by Handel and uh, Franks. But, so which is sort of a good reality test if you can do the old thing, so that comes out from one idea. And then what comes out in addition is an answer to, to this question in certain cases. So Katok had asked the, uh, the following form, it's not a conjecture. He said he doesn't, grieve any, he doesn't know if the answer is yes or no, but by having studied a lot of these things, he thinks that's an interesting question. The question is, can you in low dimensions, is it true that, cons uh, that conservative dynamic systems in low dimensions, which means for maps two dimensional and for flow three dimensional, with zero topological entropy are the limits of integrable systems. And in fact, with this one, uh, in fact, a class even uh, containing ergodic systems, he can actually approximate by using these foliations. So his, his use was using uh, these uh, foliations for constructing maps, but you can also do it for constructing partitions and others, so, but which hasn't been really used yet. So now, uh, which was also quite interesting, it turned out that uh, some other faculty members are also precisely, which we didn't know, are interested in this approximation question coming from number theory. Namely, uh, it turns out that Peter Zarnack and Bourguin study the horror cycle flow. <coughs> and as far as I understand Peter, uh, everything important, e the whole mathematics is encoded in the horror cycle flow. That was your <laughs> statement of the day, which I guess meant maybe number theory. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so that was very interesting. But but, but was even the other interesting point is that the horror cycle flow in symplectic geometry is of the universal counter example. So uh, so this is of course interesting. So it means either we ask completely disjoint questions, or maybe since you, there's something non-trivial to say on on your part, it could mean that the methods actually haven't been put, pushed to the limit yet. So so and uh, there, so Peter when he will have overcome the initial shock of the semester having started. He, he promised to give us some lectures and we will discuss it a little bit, how it comes up. So there's clearly some interesting uh, situation arising uh, in, in this area. I mean, how can it be that something is in one direction always a counter example and the other encapsulate everything? Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, that is definitely worthwhile to be investigated. Okay, so now, do we actually know all the machineries so the strongest results which we have are in dynamics, and clearly in, in this low, they should be exploited, and it's, I think there are a lot of low-hanging fruits, actually. But what we so far don't have is some good theory in high dimensions. Also in symplectic geometry, there are a lot of open questions, um, but I think uh, uh, by looking, uh, and which I do actually for time also from the dynamic systems aspect, I have the feeling there's a lot of things missing, and I want to describe that a little bit. And I will describe you, of course, what does that mean that's missing? How do you know? Well, I describe you some tests. How do I test this? And then you be the judge what you think about my test. Okay, so in physics, how do you check if something is missing? Well, you go to the Large Hadron Collider and check. Now, in symplectic geometry, well, you study ellipsoids. You observe, of course, they're much cheaper. Yeah? <laughs> Okay, so now, um, so here, here is my test. So let me first say, by experience we know, ellipsoids can be very tricky, surprisingly, very tricky, but they're always, in, in, at the very beginning, uh, I think you're aware that there are variational principles at work in symplectic geometry. Originally, when we started, it looked like a periodic orbit is a critical point, but then we ran into difficulties and we figured out sometimes products of periodic, po uh, periodic orbits are critical points of a, of, of a variational problem. And in fact, products where you, uh, where you consider iterated periodic orbits as a different object. So the first iterated to the order k, to the power k, is something different as the k iterated one. 
And then we thought we found everything, and then we found another theory where actually the, the, the k iterated first uh, return is, uh, the, uh, so if you take a fixed point to the, or to the power k, it's the same object like a fixed point of the power of the k is iterate. And these are all critical points of a function. So there's, but what I always is true is there are always, in some sense, critical, po critical points of even Mox index. So whatever we found, the critical points we get are of even Mox index. And in some of the theories, there are perfect Mox functions. Actually, in the first theory and the latter theory. So ellipsoids seem to have the, are, in some sense, perfect. There is, the periodic orbits are there for a reason. There is no cancellation. That means there is no noise. That is why I like them. You don't get confused that easily. Okay, by background noise. So now, here's, here's the problem. Define the ellipse. This is the energy, this, uh, so the energy surface for, uh, an, for enharmonic oscillators with certain properties uh, would be an energy equal to one, would be the boundary of the set. So this is the open ellipsoid. And you, you define, or it's, it's not straightforward, but you can show it's a partial ordering. You say A, so A is are this data here. These are the cross-sectional areas, if you look at the copies of R2, yeah? View this Zj as, identify C with R2. So you have a product of N copies of R2. And these are the cross-sectional areas, which you see in the copies of R2. So now, assume these things are ordered, and define a partial ordering that then A is less or equal to B, provided for every delta positive, there exists a symplectic embedding of EA into this made a little bit bigger. Yeah? Just for indication, where is the ball in this? Uh, the ball would be all the numbers are one. No, yeah, but it's a minimal element or maximal element. Okay. Well, I, well I, I, if it, well, there are smaller, well, an arbitrary small ball is, of course, you can put it into anything. But if you make these numbers here bigger, this set gets bigger. So, no, so I don't describe it can be arbitrarily small here. If the product of the AI is uh, the same. So yes, yeah, so it would be a ball of a particular radius. Yes. So, so for example, in higher dimensions, it's not known which ellipsoids you can embed into the unit ball. If that's very tiny, you can. But the perfect answer, we don't know. So, n so now, what do we know? So, so the question is, what's the partial ordering? And the test is, if I can't really say this, I don't know all the invariants. And this is the easiest thing because there are no noise, nothing. I, I don't know, of course, if it's true in higher dimensions, but I think it might be. I think that's a good test. So in dimension four, we have a complete answer, in fact, due to McDuff and embedded contact homology. And you look at the following. If you take integers d1, d2, at least one positive, and you look at this lattice here in R, then you order them increasing to multiplicity. Yeah. So if they are independent of the rationals, each has, is represented by one, but if two numbers are the same, they're repeated several times. And then you get a vector, and A is less or equals B if its component was the case. That's, that is the classification of the embedding. So that's uh, already pretty complicated. Now, so this is a complete set of in symplectic invariants. In particular, so, and these are all two-dimensional invariants. In fact, um, you can take these things here for ellipsoids, this invariants, and you can extend them for actually arbitrary sets, essentially, in, in R to N. And it turns out that this invariants here, the extensions, they all stay finite and bounded if the ellipsoids actually b b approaches a cylinder. So they are truly two-dimensional invariants. So if you look at ellipsoids, they get the longer and longer and longer. Any of these invariants stays bounded, fixed. So now, it's a complete set of invariants, and we know the volume is an invariant as well, yeah? if you can embed one into the other. And in fact, it, it can be obtained from those. So the test, so this set of invariants allows you to compute the volume. So let's assume this is a general message in higher dimensions. Let's, so one can ask the question. You can at least run the following test. 
look at all the two-dimensional invariants you know, and can you produce a volume out of those? And I tried for some time, and I, I just miss it always seriously. So uh, that's not true. And let me first say that if you want to generalize this to higher dimensions, just precisely this thing here, it's false. So this, so you could just say, well, why not doing in higher dimensions take the a1, a2, a3, do the same? Not does not work. So this does not work. It's actually due to Goose embedding theorem. It kills this immediately. So Goose constructed an, an, an embedding where the essential obstructions are, two dim are just two-dimensional invariants and the volume, <coughs> nothing in between. Goose is any dimensions, any finite dimensions. So, so, uh, so this, this method with this here only works in dimension four. In dimension six, it, it goes down big time. So we don't even, so, so, so in higher dimensions, we don't even know what a good conjecture is. All the invariants I can come up with, all from symplectic field theory and so on, just don't allow me to compute volume. So my feeling is, there is some serious real estate missing in our picture, would be my guess. So now, uh, now one can of course start contemplating what that all means. So, so now, why do I not understand what Peter is talking about when he says everything is in the whole cycle flow, and I have to admit that all the stuff I ever do just breaks down. It actually breaks down in a spectacular way. You can actually, so the whole cycle flow is the, you can view this as a free particle in a magnetic field. So you have a free particle on S2, then uh, you, have a, you have just kinetic energy, you know, so the geodesic flow, and now you switch on a magnetic field with a particular strength, and that creates a whole cycle flow. And you can show that you can find, a, you can define, so the energy surface looks like an RP3, and you can actually construct a, a one parameter family of RP3, uh, RP3s, which at time zero is the Hauer cycle flow. Before I hit time zero, you can use whatever had been invented in symplectic geometry and prove something. And precisely at time zero, somebody switches out all the lights at once. Everything <laughs> goes out. But <laughs> we know that they can actually prove interesting things from a dynamical systems perspective, which has implications in number theory and so on. So, so my feeling would be that, that, we, that, that uh, we have to generalize our uh, theory somewhat. Now the whole cycle flow, Peter correct me, has a property that basically, so first of all, every orbit is dense, but every orbit is dense sort of in the same way. It's like wherever you look, it looks sort of the same. So, so now I'm speculating, presumably can, maybe somebody can shoot me down or so. But, so maybe this is some kind of the most bot situation for another theory where the theory would be, what we are doing in dimension four would be rather a theory for invariant subsets and the relations. So the periodic orbits are replaced by invariant subsets for which one can still define the action. So I think that's possible then if, if the things are of contact type, which is a good part where you can actually prove something, then you could say this is a periodic orbit. But in general, you would have more general objects sitting there. That, is, that could be a possibility. So then, well, uh, I think uh, that in dimension four, one could verify this within a reasonable amount of time by pushing the uh, holomorphic curves methods further. Then in higher dimensions, who knows? So, so now I'm hanging around with a lot of dynamical systems people, and I thought about this for a long time, and I always come to the conclusion that there must be an exciting dynamical systems picture, which is so exciting that I think it has to be wrong. And then I forget about this, and then I try to approach it in a completely different way. And I always come up to the same thing, which is so horrifyingly nice that it has to be wrong as far as I'm concerned. But, but I always come there, and it, it, and it looks to me that, that uh, but maybe somebody can shoot me down there. But uh, if, so, it, so what we know is, that we know that there is no, high, in general you don't find, for example, smooth in a Hamiltonian system on an energy surface, you do not find high dimensional smooth invariant subsets. 
Generically, they're impossible. So now if you talk to somebody, could there be higher invariance characters? No, they're, 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 they don't exist. But, they're only, but it's always in, in the argument they don't exist because they assume they're smooth. So why not having some kind of an invariant, not so nice stuff around? Of course, this doesn't really fit in the psyche of a symplectic geometry because uh, there the, uh, the thing is always, yeah, why do you want this is technical to push it beyond to smooth, measurable or something? Just do the smooth thing. But, but I think it's quite possible that, that, the, that the objects we have to study are non-smooth objects and they're just like periodic orbits, are invariant subsets which just happen to be smooth because there is one regularizing direction which is given by the vector field. And maybe, maybe there are additional organizing principles uh, in place. Of course, the, the um, uh, KM Torah have to be put in. KM theory is a very local theory, but we also know, I think, when, when people proof that they exist, uh, it's very, I mean, by, uh, things usually all the constants have to be small. When they study them on a computer, they actually find them under much more general circumstances. So maybe there are some organizational principle in the background coming from symplectic geometry which we just overlook. Now, this, say, uh, some kind of a higher dimension theory. But, as I said, Goose shot down intermediate dimension theory. What would that mean? This would mean that this higher dimension theory have to be quite sensitive. If you look at them, they start colli collapsing. So, so my conjecture, uh, my question is, uh, conjecture is not good. <laughs> my question is, is it possible that, first of all, so I think symplectic field theory is a two-dimensional theory for the specialists. Embedded contact homology, which so far looks like a two-dimension theory in dimension four, is a co-dimension two theory, and is a, is a theory for invariant subsets, and should be extendable to higher dimensions. Donaldson's theory should be incorporated by making it a little bit more rigid into such a picture. The two-dimension theory goes up, and they interact in such a way that the co-dimension two theory does not get rigid enough to produce counterexamples to Goose theory. Two Co-dimension two objects running through the space can be stopped by a periodic orbit. I mean, you are, you are, sorry, you are in R cross in R cross M. Suppose in high dimension you have a two-dimensional object. You project it into the manifold. It's a co-dimension one object. If you have a co-dimension one object, it wants to be transversal to the flow. If a periodic orbit looks like this, it cannot run through this. You get compactness problems. If there would be a PDE or whatever describing such things. So if you look at this picture, I think one could incorporate and not violate anything we know at this point. Of course, maybe I've overlooked something. So, so my feeling is that there is some interesting things happening in higher dimensions. So, so now I spilled my heart out, so I'm looking forward to counterexample everything, which was simply my fire in my life. And, I, and the next toy I come up with a new vision. So, <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>